Hello everyone and welcome back. Now in the previous lecture I introduced you to super and subcritical pitchfork bifurcations. And I said that they're very special compared to the other types of bifurcations we've looked at. And in particular they require symmetry. So in this lecture I want to look at what happens when you break that symmetry. I'm going to look at what are called imperfect bifurcations. And we're going to do this by example, okay? So the, ex the example that we'll work through today is a simple little variation of a super critical pitchfork bifurcation, okay? So the first thing that I want you to look at here is the fact that there are two parameters now. R and H, okay? So one thing that you can notice when H is equal to zero, I get the super critical, so the super pitch fork, normal form, okay? So I get the, the normal form of the super critical pitch fork bifurcation when H is equal to zero. But if you look at what happens here, if H is not equal to zero, I destroy the odd symmetry of this problem, and therefore I don't necessarily get a pitchfork bifurcation anymore because I don't have the symmetry that I needed. So the question is what happens, right? We can track this in terms of two different bifurcation parameters. In particular, we typically refer to H as the imperfection, imperfection parameter. Now, you can include an imperfection in a whole bunch of different ways. You could include it as a quadratic term in here, or a quartic term, or all kinds of other different ways. Again, I'm doing this by specific example. I just wanna show you what can happen when you have something that breaks the symmetry that I assumed in the previous video. Okay, so the question is, what do we do with this thing? How do we analyze it, all right? Well, we start the exact same way that we always do. We look for fixed points. Now we have two different parameter values. We have to be careful here. These are going to be intersections. So intersections of y equal to minus h and y equal to rx, sorry, minus x cubed. Okay, so I'm gonna have a couple different pictures to draw, right? Because I've got two different, two different parameters that are taking place here. So let's start with the case r is less than or equal to zero. Okay, this is just a horizontal line, not very interesting. This thing, when r is less than zero, is just a sort of very, very boring cubic, right? So this is, rx minus x cubed. When r is less than or equal to zero, it's just this little sort of S-shaped kind of thing. And this would be y equal to minus h, right? And so what happens is as I vary h, I am just sort of moving up and down on this picture. And as you can see, there is only one intersection on this curve or between these two curves, right? This intersection just traces along the curve as I change the value of H, right? It just sort of comes down one fixed point, 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 one fixed point. So in this case, there is only one fixed point for all values of H. No matter what the value of H is, I always only have one fixed point. And I know that I have at least one because these things go off to plus and minus infinity, so they have to intersect somewhere. So, that, so okay, you're probably guessing then, if this is worth making a video about, there's gotta be another interesting case. So let's look at the other case here. The other case is when R is greater than zero. Now, in this case, my cubic takes this form. Okay? 
And now, if y equal to minus h is way up here, I still only have one point of intersection. But what about here? y equal to minus h, I have one, two, three points of intersection. Okay, so I went from one to three. That sounds like it should be a pitchfork bifurcation, right? That's what happens with pitchforks. But I don't have an odd symmetry, so it's probably not a pitchfork. Now, let's look at this sort of transitionary case right here. Maybe you've been getting good at these, these bifurcations and you have a pretty good idea of what's happening here, right? So this bifurcate or this fixed point, just as H changes, just kind of follows down the curve. Nothing too fancy happens. But look what happens here. Nothing, something. Nothing, two fixed points. You get a splitting that takes place here. And in particular, you can see that there's a saddle node bifurcation taking place. This thing is not bifurcating. It never changes. It just sort of follows this nice path. But what happens here is nothing touches tangentially and splits into two fixed points. So in this case, you could have, could have one, two, or three fixed points depending on what the value of h is. And what we can see from our picture is that the critical transition, so let's look at this, the critical transition is when y equal to minus h is tangent to y equal to rx minus x cubed. So how did I get that? It's that just little touching, right? And you'll get the same thing down here. If I draw another y equal to h curve, sorry, y equal to minus h, I get this, this, and this, and then y equal to minus h, just one, right? So there's another saddle node bifurcation that happens here. Here, splits into two fixed points. They emerge out of nothing. Then this one travels down and collides with the other one that didn't do anything earlier in another saddle node bifurcation. So we can maybe just mark this. Saddle node, saddle node. We can see them on the picture, right? So how do we actually find them? Well. When two things are tangent, that means their derivatives are equal to each other. So this implies that zero, the derivative of y equal to minus h, right? It's a horizontal line, it has zero derivative, is equal to r minus 3x squared, which gives us x is equal to plus or minus r over 3. So that is the value of these critical points right here that we are going to hit. And then the intersection. So this is just like what we did with the saddle node, just like what we've done with the transcritical. We have these two conditions for bifurcations to take place, this tangency condition, and then the intersection condition. And let's just look at this one, okay? I'm gonna call this one uh, x max right here. Well, that's with the positive, so x max equals to the square root of r over 3. All right, so the same thing happens over here. We'll come back to that later. But then I get r times x max uh, minus x max cubed is equal to minus h, which gives me, I get actually h as a function of r. I'm going to call it h critical as a function of r, which is equal to 2r over 3 times the square root of r over 3. Okay, super, super ugly, right? This is a r to the uh, 3 halves curve. 
And basically what it tells me is that when H is this number relative to the value of R, then I get this tangency and that tangency takes place at this value X max. Okay, so it's really, really complicated, right? We have two parameters, R and H, and we have a state variable X, okay? So we kind of have this three dimensional plane that we're thinking about things uh, existing in. Now, typically what we do when we have two bifurcation parameters is we plot things. So let's do this. Let's plot in the, the bifurcation parameter plane, okay? So let's plot in the R comma H plane, all right? So I only have a 2D surface to draw and maybe I can approximate things that are 3D, but I wanna try and keep all of my pictures being 2D so that I can interpret them, okay? So here's what I'd like to do. Here's my R H plane. And I have H critical which is a function of R, I can actually just sketch that right onto this thing. So this is my sort of critical curve. This is HC of R. And I actually have the same, I mean, due to, due to symmetry here, I have the other transition point for the negative value is just happening at the negative of this. So I get negative HC of R. And what happens is when the value of H is between these two curves, it's in this transitionary period where I have three fixed points. So I can write that on my diagram, okay? So that's what this two parameter bifurcation diagram looks like. I would say that there are in here three fixed points. And then, I'm going to use blue. Outside of that, you don't have to shade it if you don't want. I'm going to try and use different colors so you can see it. There's one fixed point. So again, with bifurcation diagrams, all we care about is the number of fixed points, at least for now. And so what this tells me is that if I am not between these two curves, I only have one fixed point. It's this guy or this guy. That's it. But if my parameter, you know, imagine I can tweak R and H and I move myself around in space and I accidentally find myself in here, well then I'm in this little strip right here where I've got three fixed points. And there's a lot going on in this picture. In particular, we would say, so R H equal to zero, zero. This thing is called a cusp point. So sometimes this will be called a cusp bifurcation, this two parameter bifurcation. So if you're gonna try and look this up, maybe on like Wikipedia or something afterwards, this would be called a cusp bifurcation. Sometimes people call it a cusp, cusp catastrophe. So catastrophe, you know, calling things catastrophes was big in the 80s. It's sort of a rebranding of singularity theory when people were obsessed with chaos. Uh, chaos sounded cool and sexy to people on the outside, and so uh, singularity theorists, they decided to call their, their studies catastrophe theory, sort of cash in on a little bit of that. So sometimes this is called a uh, cusp point or a cusp catastrophe, and the RH plane is called the parameter space. Right? There's two parameters that you can move around in. You have two dimensions to vary things around in. And so you can ask yourself, you know, what happens as I move around this entire plane now? And I get this sort of cusp singularity right here. And I get this little thing coming off of it. So let's do some bifurcation diagrams. That's too squeaky. Let's use a different color. So bifurcation diagrams. Let's first do bifurcation diagrams for fixed values of H and then for uh, fixed values of R. So let's do H equal to zero first. 
Well, we've already seen H equal to zero before. This is just your sort of standard pitchfork, supercritical pitchfork bifurcation. So, nothing fancy, right? Here's R, here's X. What about when H is positive? The same thing happens when H is negative. Uh, so I'm only gonna draw one of them, okay? This is X. Well, okay, so when H is positive, then what I get here is, uh, sorry, when H is positive, I'm sort of transitioning across like this. So I have one fixed point, one fixed point, and then I hit this value and a saddle node bifurcation takes place and I have, two, I have three fixed points now. Similarly, what's happening here is if I fix the value of, of H here, then R is going to increase up. So I always get one fixed point and then I get a saddle node bifurcation that happens sort of uh, arbitrarily or later on. And so what happens is there's always, uh, let's do this. Here's my R plane. You always get one stable fixed point and then somewhere in the R positive range, there's a saddle node bifurcation that takes place. It's really weird, right? It's really, this is an imperfect bifurcation. If H was less than zero, you would just flip the, the diagram upside down. But let's take a look at the difference between these two things, because hopefully you can see it. It kind of looks like I peeled the top branch off of this pitchfork and I took these two and brought them down here. That's the imperfect nature of this, right? Peeled the top piece off and pulled the remaining sort of saddle node down here. Now, again, how is this happening? One fixed point, one fixed point until I get to a critical value of R, at which point a saddle node bifurcation takes place and I get two more fixed points that emerge out of a saddle. We already analyzed this. We have nothing other than sat saddle node bifurcation diagrams. Uh, sorry, saddle node bifurcations taking place in our diagrams. Okay, let's also plot uh, H, or sorry, X versus H, okay? So another possibility here is if I take R less than or equal to zero, um, so this is in the HX plane. If R is less than or equal to zero, I'm on this half of my diagram, I always only have one fixed point. That's this case, right? So what happens to my, my fixed point? Well, when H is, uh, sorry, when H is positive, this thing is gonna be a negative fixed point. And then as I pull it, it becomes a positive fixed point as H gets larger and larger. Okay, so what really happens here? Almost nothing. It's basically just this picture flipped. So I get something that looks like this. always stable there's only one fixed point all that happens is when h is really really negative that fixed point is really really negative and it sort of travels as h comes down and becomes more and more positive it just travels along the curve and it's always there it's always stable no bifurcations nothing when r is positive now i get this Let's take a look. If now I'm in this half, or this, this, uh, yeah, this half of the parameter plane. R is fixed and positive, and H is gonna go from minus infinity up to positive infinity. So I'm gonna go like this. What happens? I have one fixed point, then I get three fixed points, then I get one fixed point. I have a saddle node bifurcation and another saddle node bifurcation taking place. Again, I'm in this diagram right here. H is coming down, so I have a single fixed point. And then over here, very far away from it, a saddle node bifurcation takes place. Keep coming down. These two collide in a saddle node bifurcation, and this one keeps on going. 
essentially this bifurcation diagram is going to be this is uh, it's going to be a rotation of this so let's look at it so I get the upper branch and then saddle node so I got a nice little S curve that's taking place here again when H is really really negative I have a single stable fixed point and then as H increases across that single fixed point stays on its own but over here I get a saddle node bifurcation that takes place then the unstable point of the saddle drifts and collides with the previously stable point that was not bothering anyone and its sort of brother that was birthed over here goes on and does its own thing. Now what I want you to notice here as a last piece of this is something kind of cool happening. In this region there is something called bi-stability in the system, right? We looked at this when we talked about the double well potential as well. There are two stable fixed points. Similarly here, there are two stable fixed points. It comes from the fact that there are three of them now, right? There's some sort of competition that has emerged in our model. And which one will win out depends on where you start on the phase line diagram. Do you start closer to this one and get sucked into it? Or do you get, start closer to this one and get sucked into it? Okay, this was a hard one, right? I know that this is hard. If you made it all the way through this lecture, you're probably confused. It takes a lot of practice. I highly recommend trying to reproduce a lot of these key ideas yourself, in particular these bifurcation diagrams. They are not easy. I want you to be able to try and do this by yourself so that you can really, really sort of figure out how I got these diagrams. It takes a lot of time. Don't get frustrated. This is not an easy thing to do. These two parameter bifurcations, this is something that people are still actively working on, right? It's a very, very hard aspect of dynamical systems. So don't get frustrated with it but at least admire the sort of beauty of how cool this is. I'll see you in the next video.